This week's watchword gives us hope. God is faithful, Paul writes, for by him you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. It's such a joy to welcome all of you to worship today, whether you are joining us by video stream or you are here with us. And to help us get to know each other, if you please sign the Ritual of Friendship pad that's located at the end of your pews. This morning it is such a pleasure for us to welcome new members into the fellowship of our congregation. Lauren and Justin Stoltz and their sons Alexander and Felix join us by letter of transfer and Brian Peterson joins us by reaffirmation of faith. And we hope that you'll take a moment after our service today to greet our new members. Please also note that both the greeter and flower reservation books for 2020 are available for sign-ups. And greeters are particularly needed for January and beyond, so we hope you'll sign up today in the notebooks that you'll find located on the lectern, which is near the sanctuary piano. And mark your calendars for Wednesday, February the 5th, when our winter spring season of 
Calvary at the table begins with dinner at 5 p.m. in Fellowship Hall, followed by a variety of programming for all ages. And please take note of all the other important announcements in the bulletin today about offerings here at Calvary and in our province. Please keep members Doc Fischel and Bill Hampton in your prayers uh, as they recover from surgeries this week. We also ask for your prayers for Sterling Griggs, who is the son of Ron and Sherry Griggs. Sterling is a patient at ICU at Baptist Hospital following valve replacement surgery this week. So remember these individuals as you spend time with God this week in prayer. And now let us prepare ourselves for worship as we listen to the prayer.
let us join now in praying together the liturgy for the affirmation of baptism found on page 170 in the front of your blue Moravian Book of Worship. In grace, God called and chose the people of Israel and established with them a covenant. I will be your God and you will be my people. In that relationship, they were to be freed from sin and become a blessing to all. Then God came to us in Jesus Christ and fulfilled that covenant for all people. Through Christ's life, death, and resurrection, God made for us a new covenant of grace. We come before you with joy, O God, to claim the promises of your covenant. Our Lord Jesus Christ instituted baptism as the visible means of entry into the new covenant. <coughs> baptism is a gift of God. In this sacrament, through grace and the power of the Holy Spirit, we are united with Christ, are cleansed by His saving work, enter into the fellowship of the church, and are called to a life of faith and willing obedience. Claimed by God in baptism, we pray that through the power of the Holy Spirit, our lives may quickly affirm the blessings of Christ's new covenant. Now addressing the candidates for membership, as you present yourselves before God and this congregation, we call upon you to profess your faith. Do you believe in God as your creator and loving heavenly Father, in Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, and in the Holy Spirit as your comforter and sustainer, according to the Holy Scriptures. Lord, make us one with all your children as we profess our faith, saying together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The congregation may be seated. Brian, Justin, and Lauren, do you in this faith turn away from sin, evil, and selfishness in your thoughts, words, and actions? And do you intend to participate actively in Christ's church? serving God all the days of your life. Let us now turn to the reaffirmation of faith on page 173. Brian, you have affirmed your faith in baptismal covenant before God and this congregation, and by the grace and strength of Christ have declared your desire and promise to renew your Christian discipleship. We welcome you with joy and thanksgiving. May the Lord be with you. Build yourself up on your most holy faith led by the Holy Spirit. Keep yourself by grace and the love of God as you wait for our Lord Jesus Christ in His mercy to give you eternal life. And now the transfer of membership. Lauren and Justin, through baptism, profession of faith and Christian service, you have already entered into the life of the Church Universal and today we rejoice to welcome and receive you into the fellowship of this congregation. Continue faithfully in the good way you have chosen in Christ. And may the Holy Spirit bless you in your life among us. And may we all, through grace, be enabled to support and encourage one another in Jesus Christ, our Lord. As we sing the hymn of reception on page 174, I would invite the members of our joint board to come and extend the right hand of fellowship to our new members.
continue our worship remembering the words of our Lord Jesus and how he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. that we bring this morning. Accept the love of our hearts, the devotion of our souls, all that we have and all that we are, that we may together proclaim the good news of your love to our community and to those around us. So we ask for your blessing upon these offerings and upon us, that you will use us in powerful ways. For we ask these things through Christ our Lord and our light. Amen. You may be seated. Our Old Testament lesson is from the book of Psalms, chapter 40, verses 1 through 11. To the choir master, a psalm of David. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the desolate pit, out of the miry bog, and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not turn to the proud to those who go astray after false gods. Thou hast multiplied, O Lord my God, thy wondrous deeds and thy thoughts toward us. 
none can compare with thee. Were I to proclaim and tell of them, they would be more than can be numbered. Sacrifice and offering thou dost not desire, but thou hast given me an open ear. Burnt offering and sin offering thou hast not required. Then I said, Lo, I come. In the roll of the book it is written of me, I delight to do thy will, O my God. Thy law is within my heart. I have told the glad news of deliverance in the great congregation. Lo, I have not restrained my lips, as thou knowest, O Lord. I have not hid thy saving help within my heart. I have spoken of thy faithfulness and thy salvation. I have not concealed thy steadfast love and thy faithfulness from the great congregation. Do not thou, O Lord, withhold thy mercy from me. Let thy steadfast love and thy faithfulness ever preserve me. Our epistle lesson is from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus, and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God which is at Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to God always for you because of the grace of God which was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him with all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony to Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Please stand for the reading of the Gospel. Gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ according to John chapter 1 verses 29 through 42. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, before he was, for he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this I came baptizing with water, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness, I saw the Spirit descend as a dove from heaven, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain This is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. The next day, again, John was standing with two of his disciples. And he looked at Jesus as he walked and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following, and said to them, What do you seek? And they said to Jesus, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with with him for that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. 
He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, So you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. like to invite the kids forward as we have something to share with them. So come on down. How's everybody doing? You can just have a seat wherever. How is everybody? Excellent. Everybody enjoying the new year? Yeah, it's 2020 now. It's kind of kind of crazy to even think about. So I have a question for you all. Can you guys help me with something? What is a pinky promise? Does anybody know? Anybody know? What's a pinky promise? What you got? That's right. Anybody, how do you do one? Can we, anybody, anybody know how to do a pinky promise? How do you do it? Like this, right? And when you do a pinky promise, that's like super, like, that's like a special promise, right? Like you gotta make sure you keep a pinky promise because there's like a secret bond that's made by like the pinky handshake, right? That you can never, ever, ever break a pinky promise. Now, here's the second question. Have you guys ever had a promise broken to you? Everybody ever, anybody ever, yeah, is that a yes that we're raising hands for? <laughs> yeah, it, and it's not very fun. It's not a good feeling when somebody says like, oh, I'm going to do this thing, and then they don't do it, right? It's kind, of a, it's kind of a not very good feeling. But on the other hand, like, it is a really, really good feeling if somebody says, hey, I'm going to help you with this, and then they show up, and they help you with it, and it makes you feel like you're appreciated, and you're valued, and that's a really cool feeling. But, you know, we're all humans, and we're not perfect, so sometimes not our, other people don't always keep their promises. But I want to talk to you about something else about promises. And did you know that God made promises to you? Did you know this? that God made promises to each one of you, that he made a promise that he would love you, that he would care for you, that he would be there for you, no matter what, no matter what we're feeling, whether we're feeling really, really sad or really, really lonely or really, really happy or really, really excited, God made a promise that he would always be there. And we know that promise is true because we celebrate, and, uh, we celebrate Jesus and his death and his resurrection. And then, the, then this thing called the Holy Spirit showed up. And the Holy Spirit is with us all the time. It's with us all the time. Even when we may not feel it, uh, the Holy Spirit is there with us. And that's God's promise to us. And that's God's promise that he is going to be with you. And God's faithful to that promise. That's a big word that means that God will never break that promise. That he is always going to be with you no matter what. So why don't, we, <clears throat> why don't we pray and thank God that he has made some awesome promises to each of us. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much that you are faithful to us. God, we thank you that you made promises to be with us and that you have shown those promises to be true because you sent your spirit to be with us. You sent Christ to be with us. So Lord, be with us now. Remind us of those promises when we feel, uh, when, we may, when we need that reminder. So God, be with each one of us this week. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right. You guys are off to children's church. Oh, you, I think you got to go. You gonna preach the sermon for me? No. Oh. opportunity now as a congregation to do the same thing, to turn to God, to remind ourselves of God's faithfulness and the promises that he's bestowed to each of us. So let us do that now as we turn to God in prayer.
Lord, we come to you this morning, often with busy hearts and busy minds, but we turn to you now, trusting in who you are, trusting in the promises that you've laid before us. For we know that our God has done wondrous things, too numerous to count. And through steadfast love and faithful care, God continues to enrich each one of us in new ways. So therefore, may we chase after God with a reckless abandon, with the reckless abandon required of faith. So let us offer ourselves to God this day, giving all that we have and all that we are in faithful prayer. God of steadfast love, you raise us up when we fall and place us on our feet. You give us steady ground to stand on. We're strengthened by your faithfulness. So we offer our prayers in thanksgiving for the grace that is ours in Christ. God, we pray for the mission of your church, that we may proclaim the good news of this age as we put our trust in you. God, we pray for the world, that through your saving love, that it may reach to the ends of the earth, as we all serve for the common good. Savior, we pray for all those who suffer, that we may heed their cry as we share in your steadfast mercy. Abundant God, we pray for your creation, that we may safeguard its well-being as we labor together for redemption. God of eternal peace, we remember before you those have died and entered into your more immediate presence. Though we mourn their loss, we know they're in your hands now. God of hope, we pray for those who are close to us who struggle, friends, family, and co-workers who are suffering mentally, physically, or emotionally. Greet them with your peace. God, we thank you that you are a God who listens and hears our prayers. So through Christ, with Christ, and in Christ, we lift these up to you this morning. Amen.
Come, Holy Spirit, open our ears to the truth of your word, that the testimony of Christ may be strengthened among us, and the good news of deliverance revealed. In your name we pray. Amen. So this morning, I want to talk a bit about faithfulness. And I don't want to talk about this in terms of our faithfulness, but I want to talk about uh, faithfulness, which is not something... uh, I want to talk about faithfulness in the terms of God's faithfulness to us, which is not something we often talk about. But I want to explore that topic a bit more this morning, raising the question, how is God faithful to us? And we hear this idea uh, first uh, this morning echoed in our psalm reading, where we read, I have, <clears throat> I have not hidden your saving help within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your steadfast love and your faithfulness from the great congregation. So to go deeper on this idea of God's faithfulness, we're actually going to take a look at Paul's letter to the first Corinthians. And we read the first verses of this as our epistle lesson this morning. But to really get at the depth of these verses, we need to know a little bit about what is going on in Corinth while Paul is writing this letter. And Corinth at this time uh, was a thriving city. It was a thriving city both politically and economically. It was a bustling city, um, one of the larger cities in the area of the time. It was the, one of the main cities of Greece, and there was a church already established in Corinth by the time Paul was writing this letter. And there's some indication that Paul had a heavy influence at the beginnings of that church in Corinth. But, that's, but the occasion of Paul's letter to the Corinthians is because he had gotten word that the church in Corinth is struggling. And that is... Uh, about the easiest way to put the state of the church in Corinth. They're having doctrinal disputes. They're having lawsuits amongst its members. They're abusing the Lord's Supper to get drunk. And there's wildly inappropriate behavior connected with pagan temple practices that heavily promoted temple prostitution. So, it would be an understatement to say that the Corinthian church was in conflict. They're not doing so hot when Paul's writing this letter. They're heavily fractured and they're on the ropes. Now the church today is not generally struggling with things like pagan temple prostitution and getting drunk during the communion service. It's not something that's common to most churches today. But it doesn't take a deep look at the church today to find many struggles, many struggling with things not too far from the things the church at Corinth struggles with. Debates on doctrines, wrestling with addictions, inappropriate and even abusive relationships. And today, many people recount trauma that they've experienced at church for the reason that they no longer are a part of one. And if we take an honest assessment of the global church, these issues often find themselves to be fairly present. And even if a particular church has none of these struggles and has never seen any of these struggles, many people outside the church assume that these issues are present in most churches, if not all. So Paul's letter to the Corinthians on these issues can still ring true for us today. We don't have to think of this letter as something written 2,000 years ago that has nothing to do with us today. And Paul had a lot to say to the church at Corinth about all of these issues. He addresses each one of them. But that comes later. That's not found in the verses that we read this morning. What I find really interesting about Paul's letter is how he starts it, how he begins it, which is the words that we read today. But we had to know of all these struggles to really get its impact. Because Paul wrote knowing all of these struggles, knowing that the whole purpose of this letter was to address each one of these issues. And he still starts his letter remarkably positive. 
And it's this remarkable positivity that I think connects to the faithfulness of God, which is an idea extremely important to Paul. <clears throat> His opening words, which we read today, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, together with all those who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. These are the words Paul starts with. He calls them saints. He calls them saints. And he says that they're sanctified in Christ. They're not primarily, first, drunks, adulterers, and argumentative troublemakers, which are probably accurate ways to describe the church at Corinth. But Paul calls them saints. Paul seems to think the Corinthians need not be told off, but rather be told who. The church at Corinth needed to be reminded who they are and whose they are. This is the first point that I want to make about God's faithfulness, and that's God's faithfulness tells us who we are. God's faithfulness tells us who we are. And we are beloved saints of God. Before we move on, we need to talk a little bit about what it means to be a saint. This can be a tricky word <clears throat> to bounce around these days. Because in our world today, we think of a saint as a spiritual superstar, right? Like you're the one, who you're at the church every time the doors are open. You, like you are the saint. You know everything going on. You're perfect in all of your dealings. You know you, you are on God's will 110%. Of the time. You have to have chosen and achieved something great for God to be a saint. But if, they were def but if saints were defined by their achievements, the Corinthians are dropouts. They're not saints. Because that's not how God defines a saint. For Paul, a saint is someone God has called and named a saint. And that is every one of us. No matter what we have done, no matter who we are, we just have to accept that God has accepted us as a saint and leads us down a path of sanctification. God's faithfulness tells us who we are. And we are saints of the living God found in Christ. But the beauty of this is that we are not saints alone either. The Corinthians are saints together with all of those who call on God in every place and every time. See, Paul speaks of a communion of saints, not a bunch of isolated individual saints, but a communion of saints together. And as Moravians, this is an idea that should resonate even deeply with us. For every Easter sunrise, what do we say that we do? We gather in God's acre to be with the saints who have gone before us. That even though this, there are saints who are not physically present, once a year we as Moravians remember that there are saints who have gone before us that are intricately connected to the church that is physically manifested today. The saints transcend physical time and space. They remain with us. The communion of saints is both physical. We act it out here and now when we gather as the church. But it is also eternal. For those presents are never lost. The key thing about Paul coming to the Corinthians about coming to the Corinthians and calling them saints, is he is telling them who their identity is. And this identity is continued on today. See, when God looks at our church, 
just like the one in Corinth. God doesn't see failures. God doesn't see troublemakers. God sees saints. And many of us often feel a a sense of disappointment in our Christian life. We don't go to church enough. We don't read our Bible enough. We don't pray enough. We don't whatever enough. We don't give enough. We don't do enough. We feel a pressure to be the spiritual superstar. But you're chasing after something that God doesn't want you to chase after. Because your sainthood is already secure. For God has already called you a saint. We know that our troubles and our conflicts don't reflect well on our Savior. But that doesn't hold God back from blessing us. When God looks at us, God doesn't see failures. He sees saints. And who are we to disagree with God on that one? See, the Corinthians are not saints because of their own efforts, but because God has chosen them, because God has reached out to them and called them and made them his own. And who would Paul be to disagree with God on that one? So God's faithfulness tells us who we are. And we are called saints by God. And the second and last point I'd like to make about God's faithfulness this morning comes from this text. And it's God's faithfulness binds us together. God's faithfulness binds us together. When when Paul talks about the saints, he gives us a clue to what the church is to be like. Paul subtly informs the Corinthians of what it means to be the body of Christ when he talks about being saints. And like we said, the most important part about this is that we're not individual saints, but we're a communion of saints, just like the Apostles' Creed puts it. All whom God has made holy participate in God's sanctifying process. Together with all those who in every place all call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's from verse 2. Paul even notes his teamwork with other apostles. He he notes it with Timothy later on in this chapter, recognizing that Paul is not, not doing this work alone. And later in this letter, Paul will insist that unity is a simple, is essential mark of the church. Not because he sees unity as an expression of sort of positive collegiality or good manners, This isn't the knowing how to act in polite company kind of thing that Paul is getting at. Paul is talking about a different kind of unity. The unity Paul talks about declares a key and important aspect of Christian identity. Believers belong to Christ. Therefore, they belong to one another. And together, they form the body of Christ. Now, I realize this is not the easiest thing to preach in particularly divisive times. Times when we're eager to sacrifice unity to shame difference, to victimize the vulnerable, to idolize majority rule, and to identify scapegoats. Across every corner of culture today, we seem to be eager to divide ourselves up. And I wouldn't imagine not many preachers want to take on this topic in sermons these days. But this passage demands it. This passage tells us that unity is found in Christ our wounded Savior. And we must continue to strive for unity. And as Moravians, again, this is particularly important to us. Our most important document within the Moravian church is called the ground of the unity. 
And in its formation, it started after World War II. It was when the need arose for the coming together of such a document in also very divisive times. In the most divisive of times, the Moravians across the globe found it necessary to create a document focused on the unity of the church. And we even find it in our motto. Liberty is there. Unity in liberty, held in tension together. So we have hope for unity in the same way that we have hope that each of us are a saint. It happens because we're not doing it. See, our unity is not dependent on our efforts. It's dependent on our faithfulness. It is God's faithfulness that tells us we are saints. And it is God's faithfulness that binds us together. And our unity is bound up in God's faithfulness to us. So our job is to live that out as broken, stumbling humans. Because that's what we do best. We stumble through life in faith, trusting in a Savior. So we won't be saints on our own. And we won't have unity on our own. It all requires the faithfulness of God. And our faithfulness to make Christ and him crucified our soul confession of faith. There is nothing else but Christ and him crucified. The more we do that, the more we lean on the faithfulness of God. We are held together. We are held together in God's faithfulness. Let us pray. Holy God, you sent your Son to be the light of the world so that all may know the brightness of your love. So fill us with your grace this day that we too may bear witness to his light and your faithfulness. May we in unity serve your coming reign. In Christ our, our Savior's name we pray. Amen.
now may God's steadfast love and mercy lead you. May God make your steps secure, keeping you safe on the journey. And may God's faithfulness keep you on paths of righteousness and peace.